Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for DSPA for inviting us to this. Uh, we're going to be talking about data science and music. My name is Nick, and this is James. Hey, everyone. Uh, and I'm the founder of Personal and Neuro Music Health. And today, we're just going to run you through um, our approach, how we sort of look at data and music, and what we aim to do with that in the future. So I'll give you a very brief overview of my background and how we got here, and then we'll get into the fun stuff uh, around data science. So a little bit about my background. Uh, once upon a time, I was a professional DJ. I grew up in Ibiza in Spain, and I was a resident DJ at Pasha Ibiza for many years. I actually started a DJing professionally when I was 16 years old, and was very fortunate to be able to travel around the world in my early 20s. But while I was DJing, there was always this nagging question in my head to understand what was actually happening uh, with my audience, with the dance floor, because I knew there was something magical happening, but I couldn't really explain it. And it wasn't until 2004 that I discovered a book by, uh, actually, no, an album cover by Prince called Musicology. And I'd never heard of that word before. I then looked it up, and that kind of changed the course of my career. So I'm a uh, musicologist by trade, and for the last 18 years, I've been studying the effects of music on the body and the mind and how we can apply that in digital experiences. Uh, obviously, when I started studying this, digital wasn't at the forefront, so it was more around understanding the effects that music has uh, on the physiological um, so that's a little bit about my background. I'll hand it over to James now to talk a little bit about his background, and then we can go into the different processes that we're doing at the moment. Thank you, Nick. My name's James Curtis. I am a new member of the Mirror Music Health team, and I'm also a PhD student at RMIT in Melbourne, uh, where I'm currently investigating the capacity for machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, for creative design tools for musicians. Uh, but prior to this, I spent a number of years working as a research assistant uh, for a few different labs um, and a few different institutions around Melbourne. And that background um, in working as a, as a research assistant, typically my role would be somewhere between a bespoke um, software engineer, but also uh, in as a data scientist um, preparing the the data capture methods but also trying to evaluate them against the literature and um and trying to think think laterally about the the data that we'd collected and so some of the labs that i've worked with uh predominantly i work with the audio kinetic experiments lab and the long-running project of that lab has been to investigate the relationship between music and movement. But our current focus is working with the elderly uh, in the aged care space. And we're looking at the capacity for music and also movement to, to mediate and facilitate uh, some of the issues around cognitive decline. Um, but also for people who are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and I've been involved in a few um, research engagements with facilities around Melbourne, uh, trialling some of these methods. The other labs that I work with, uh, one is the Bio-Inspired Digital Sensing Lab, which draws influence from nature, but typically tends to focus on vision and colour um, and colour problems. Uh, but myself and the head of the Audio Kinetic Experiments Lab uh, we, our focus tends to be more in sound and in music uh, and neuroscience. So we, we work in conjunction with BIDS uh, sometimes where we lend our expertise in sound. The other lab that I work with is the Spatial Information Architecture Lab and that is a multi-channel audio lab at RMIT uh, where we experiment with um, spatial sound. So that's just a little bit about my background. Um, my work as a research assistant has really facilitated my understanding around data science, and it's it's really helped me in this new role at Mirror Music Health. 
So before we talk about Mirror Music Health, uh, Nick, why don't you tell us about the history of Personal and where this all came from? Uh, when I started my company six years ago, that was Personal AI. The mission was to be able to create personalized music experiences, uh, particularly playlists. Playlists that were dynamic, that would change based on uh, what you needed. So if you were listening to music at home, you're relaxing, but then you were going to go out to the shops, you might just want to boost the playlist that you were listening to. So very easy interactions. But I uh, very quickly found that the metadata in streaming was very, very messy and very complex. And when we did a deep dive into it, I actually decided that that was something that needed to be fixed if we were to ever create that really beautiful personalized experience. So we went down that rabbit hole. Uh, I'm not an engineer. That's not my background. Uh, so I had to learn a lot about machine learning and data science in general. But the idea was very simple. Today in streaming, there's a lot of complexity around genre classification and being able to find song, things in, in songs like the instrumentation. Is it an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar? And we've come a long way with data science, and there's some amazing analysis tools out there. But none of that actually applies to how we humans perceive music and how it informs our music taste. It's actually a very simplified process in the brain. The brain analyzes the music. Uh, it tells us immediately if it's something that we've heard of before or if it's something new. Uh, what kind of vibe it gives us. Does it make us feel good or bad? Is it happy or sad? And what is the melody structure? Is it a male, female voice or is it instrumental? All of this happens at a, uh, in a split of a second. And then from there, we basically either decide whether we enjoy that music or we don't. So when we look at music taste, we need to look more at those types of elements versus does the song have a male or female vocal. Uh, so we ended up creating the AI music brain, which was trying to match the human process. And the idea was we have a simplified genre map. So we don't need 4,000 subgenres that most streaming services use. We use about 100. And the idea there is that we have a top level of genres and then a layer down, we have subgenres that are connected based on vibe. Now, clearly there's a lot of influence here from my uh, days as a DJ. And, you know, as a DJ, one of the biggest things you do is find songs that fit together to create a, a journey, an experience. And all of that has sort of come together in the AI music brain. So now together with James, it's figuring out what are the elements in the music that we can analyze, refine, optimize to be able to create these very personalized experiences. Thanks, Nick. So how does that differ to what we're doing at Maroon Music Health? So Maroon Music Health is um, a new company, but the focus there is very specific around music from your past, from the day you were born up until now, that will trigger certain parts of your brain and trigger brain stimulation to make you feel better. Uh, this is designed specifically for people with cognitive decline, so brain aging, which is the process of the brain getting older. And uh, we liken it very much to the, like your muscles and joints stiffening up as you get older. The brain sort of does the same thing. You need to be able to keep it stimulated. And actually one of the best ways to do that is through music. So this is rapidly becoming a critical issue for not only us here in Australia, but for many nations around the world. We're all becoming aware that our populations are aging. The percentage of people in our populations that are in their elder years is projected to grow over the coming decades. So how can we ensure that people retain their cognitive abilities and ultimately their freedoms? Well, we know music can be an important and powerful tool for that, but in order to be able to use that tool effectively, it's important to consider people's cultural and personal histories. And a big part of the reason that we're looking at that at Maroon Music Health is because here in Australia, we're a very multicultural nation and it's a big part of our cultural identity and it's something that we're, we're proud of. We're looking at the different cultural backgrounds of people that are in our aged care facilities and the kinds of musical experiences that might be more beneficial to those people. And by building taste profiles that 
consider not only people's cultural histories, but also individual histories and how they interrelate is something that we're looking at in the data. And it's a really important tool for us to build these musical experiences. So the way that we craft these musical experiences is that we consider music in three different functions. We think about music for energizing. We think about music for relaxation, but we also think about music for memory. And the context of music and memory, especially in the elderly, is especially powerful if we think about people with Alzheimer's uh, or dementia. And we're all probably familiar with some of the examples, uh, even quite recently, with Music to Awaken, where a ballet dancer was played the theme for Swan Lake and was immediately taken back to that moment in time and carrying out those, those movements. So in that example, we were fortunate enough to know this, this person's history and their history with that song. But one of the questions that we're thinking about at Murray Music Health at the moment is, what about people who can't communicate that information? How do we, how do we help people who can't communicate to identify their personal history? And so we're looking at sensor technologies as being a, a powerful tool for us to be able to communicate personal history through data. And one of the mechanisms that we're looking at to do this uh, would be through facial analysis and body posture analysis. And then also through biometrics, uh, through wearable technologies, uh, measuring galvanic skin response, for instance, or heart rate variability. Uh, these are metrics that we can use to be able to indicate valence and an emotional state. So if we can plot those emotional states, we can begin to get a picture of people's response to music and their individualized response and how their emotional state is being affected by the music. And through that data, we can begin to apply that to others. And it's especially problematic to go into the, the aged care space uh, in given the current situation with, um, with protocols and, and the global pandemic. But through optical technologies, it gives us an opportunity to be able to interface with this world at a distance. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing in the age of uh, machine learning and, and facial recognition and, and body posture analysis. It gives us the potential to be able to still work with these communities using this technology. So that constitutes some of our plans for working with the elderly into 2021. I'd like to talk to you just very briefly about our central corpus of data, which is our Dementia DB data set. And that is 817,000 tracks. So it's about 4.6 terabytes of audio data. And in order to work with this data set, uh, we've developed two different mechanisms that help us with genres and also with, uh, with audio features. So the first of these is the Diller Music Genre Classifier. And this was developed in order to simplify a genre map it's quite common now to have many different subcategories and subgenres for music. And what we've identified is that this is, uh, this is a problem for the search space. It's, it's ultimately unwieldy and, and unuseful to be able to have these subcategories if they're not populated by very many things, or these are genre taxonomies that aren't being searched by people and they're simply not aware of them. So we, we simplify our genre map using our Dillo Music Classifier. But in order to counteract that, we uh, expand our audio features using the Vibe model that we've been developing. And that gives us the ability to extract a layer of audio features that, that supplement this simplified genre map. So for instance, uh, the, there's a metric in Vibe to measure the mellowness of a track. And that is a, that's a metric that can be applied independent of genre. So it can help us to be able to search for a particular feature of a track uh, independent of genre but it can also help us move across genres in a playlist and so we can plot experiences in that way and we're not we're not limited by uh, moving through tricky terrain of, of sub genres so by using a vibe model we can build a unique taste profile for each of our users and that gives us a, a different kind of perspective when we fold that in with our cultural data and historical data uh, and musical charts we're able to understand some of the selections that our users are making and and that informs our, our model even further so these are the kinds of uh, developments that we're working on currently with our data set but we're always running new kind of analyses on them 
So that's been a quick tour through some of the things that we're working on at Murray Music Health, but also some of our plans for the future. Uh, before I pass it back to Nick, I just want to say thank you to the DSPA for giving us the opportunity to talk with you all today. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure to be able to share our vision with you, and hopefully we've been able to either inform or inspire you in that process. So thanks again. So I guess the only thing uh, I'd want to say to everyone out there that is tuning in, listening, um, if you have any questions, feedback, comments, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we'll have the information on the link so you can email us. We are trying to push the boundaries of what we can do with audio analysis now and in the future and always looking to collaborate with like-minded people. So if you have any interesting thoughts on the subject, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.